Hey, welcome to my in-depth tour of a $5,000 upgrade of fart sounds. Roll the intro. So I got really into modular in like 2014, 2015, and to be completely honest with you, in the past few years, I've not really been that into modular. I've actually been a bit bored of it. Now, all of this provides a beautiful backdrop for monologues like this and probably visually tricks some of my viewers into thinking that I know what I'm talking about. But other than that, the only purpose it's really served is hooking other gear that I'm showcasing on this channel up to it just to show you. Other than that, I've not really been using it at all, which is kind of tragic when you consider the amount of time and money that I put into it over the years. I guess if you add it all up, I could have been a boat guy. But it's also not healthy to look at things like that because up until around 2021, I used it all the time. I've scored films with it, it's all over my albums, and I could still sell it if I wanted to. So to me, it's still a net positive. But I don't want to sell it. I want to go back to feeling that inspiration of finding new sounds that I've never heard before and making entire songs as a result of happy accidents, because that's what modular is all about. And after carefully picking out 13 modules to replace some old ones I don't use anymore, and after reorganizing both my workflow and power routing, mission accomplished. I'm back, I'm inspired, I'm addicted, and I'm happy. This video is going to be a very long adventure, and I'll be putting in chapters in case you're not in the mood for a long adventure. Initially, I had planned on making three or four different separate videos showcasing these modules, and I guess just sort of doing good old synth reviews like I used to, but I think all of this ties together too much, and more importantly, you might be here to see and hear this, and then you'll find out about this, and then you'll also find out why I tossed this in the bin. I want you to discover all the things that I did. This video is not going to be reviewing or rating modules or encouraging you to buy something or not buy something. What I hope this video influences you to do is think about different workflows with gear that you already own so when you get in that creative rut, when you get bored with things, you can be re-inspired. I hope. But first, I would like to thank Perfect Circuit for sponsoring this video and helping me fund my modular addiction while also being the largest modular store I've ever been to. It's kind of like giving a beggar money and then selling them a meal afterwards, but all I really care about is that the meal is tasty, and it is, I've gone way off track here. Perfect Circuit is a website that carries loads of Eurorack modules and semi-modular synths and non-modular synths and effects pedals and pro audio and recording gear, but it also exists outside of the metaverse in the real world. And if you live anywhere near Burbank, California, go there because it is like a synthesizer museum where you can play around with stuff and actually find out in real life if you like a product before spending your hard-earned money on it. If you are nowhere near Southern California, they ship worldwide and have a generous return policy. I have a giant pile of affiliate links in the description and I donate 100% of my affiliate income to the ACLU. All right, get comfortable, let's dig in. This video took weeks to make. I am so excited about this new setup. Like, actually, dopamine is flowing. I want to stop talking to the f***ing camera and just go make music. All right, you ready, Nancy? Create Audio West Pest Semimodular Analog Synthesizer. Retails for 249 US dollars. So these two modules here are from Create Audio, and I'm going to be completely honest with you, from the insider view of this industry, every other company is annoyed by how Create Audio can sell their modules for so cheap because it doesn't make sense to anybody, especially after the chip shortage, but somehow they're able to actually undercut companies that have their own factories like Behringer and create modules that are, in my opinion, far more interesting and original and well-designed. So this West Pest here doesn't actually need a Eurorack setup to use. It comes in this case, which has its own power supply that it comes with and an on-off switch, and it could just rest in here. I took it out and put it in here. I don't even know why I did, but I did. The West Pest itself is one of the most powerful West Coast or Buchla style modules that I've seen. Even the oscillators are among the most powerful. And then you have a fold, and then you have a sequencer, an arpeggiator, a random source generator. And so this analog West Coast style synthesizer slash sequencer that is fully functional in its own case can be had for less than $250. So this is coming directly out of the oscillator output. So let's go through all the waves. Ooh, I 
I love that one. Okay, now this is what I love. It has this sort of internal sample and hold to where every key press will randomize the waveform. And then you could actually attenuate that a little bit. The input or the LFO can act as the FM input. So instead of a low-pass filter like we have on our familiar subtractive synthesizers, the West Coast style, a lot of times they have wave folders, and that sounds like this. So let's go through all the waves. And just like with the pitch, we could modulate the folding with an input or with the LFO. Another thing worth pointing out, and I really do like this, is this LFO has two different ranges. So it could go from this sort of crazy, almost a normal oscillator range, all the way down, and just change it to super slow if you want to. All right, so now we're coming out of the main output, and we have sort of a VCA here. I'm going to go back to that random waveform. So for the purpose of this being in my main modular rack, these are the things I'm most interested in. Everything else is fun, but I probably won't be using it on a daily basis, but I'm going to give you a quick overview of what this can do. One thing that I'm not used to seeing with the wave folder circuit is resonance. It could be like the weirdest acid house ever. Another really unusual thing is a release modulator. It's just proper weird. So we have both a 32-step sequencer and an arpeggiator, and both operate a little bit differently than what you're probably used to. There are a lot of randomization options. There are options of playing it in a different order, things like that. You could generate sequences. We also have a multi-out here, which we could assign to be MIDI CV, a clock-synced LFO, a random CV generator, and a decay envelope with an additional control of the synth voice. And let's just plug it into the fold mod. I believe it's on the randomization mode. Additionally, we have swing. And then one of my absolute favorite features about this when using it as a standalone is that the clock has, I don't know how to describe this. It's like a clocked random clock. I guess I'm, I'm just gonna show it to you. Create audio function junction envelope generator and mixer. Retails for 199 US dollars. Like just about everybody in the Eurorack space, I absolutely love the make noise maths. And I actually thought about buying another one just because I really love that type of modulation source. But I wanted something a little bit different. Let's use it with the West Pest here. And I'm going to patch it into the fold mod. And let's just start with the LFO. Square LFO goes into fold mod in. Wonderful. Triangle LFO. The range is pretty good, especially down here. Okay, so alternatively, I'm just going to plug it into mix, turn output three all the way up. Three is the LFO. Two is this envelope slash function generator, and one is a loopable envelope. And these can go very long. <laughs>
even with this sound only playing when the gate is pressed, if we make it loopable, we could get some pretty rad results. If we want to mix that with the LFO, we could just go out of mix here. And now we'll have this sort of concoction of both. <laughs> with number two, you could change the curve. Which, when paired with this, actually does make it very Buchla-like. I would say that my only complaint with the function junction is that this dark red background here makes the black text a little bit hard to read, and I can imagine if it's at a distance on my modular, I, I might have to squint a bit to see it. Create Audio also makes something called the East Beast, which is a subtractive synthesizer, pretty much the exact same size as this. That also comes in its own standalone case. And I believe that also costs $250. As you're about to see, I already have plenty of subtractive synthesis oscillators and filters picked out. So I didn't go with that, but that is worth checking out if you're entering the world of modular. Pittsburgh Modular Tiger Desktop Semi-Modular Analog Synthesizer retails for $799 US dollars. My first modular system had maybe six modules, and I would say at least two of them were from Pittsburgh Modular. With a few rare exceptions, Pittsburgh Modular has always made good sounding, reliable, vanilla subtractive synthesis modules. And this seems like the first time that they're actually taking a big leap and making something that is radically different from that. And they hit it out of the park, in my opinion. So a really brief overview. We have MIDI in, a clock source, an arpeggiator. It has randomization options, also has a sequencer. Sequencer's not that powerful, but it's useful if that's all you have. It has three oscillators, which are probably the most exciting part of this. It has a mixer. It has two different filters. One of them is a very wide range, high pass, band pass, low pass has an LFO. Another filter over here is built into the dynamics, which also has compression, and you could kind of shape the transients of the sound. I've never seen that before in a module. A noise oscillator, two ADSR envelope generators, a sample on hold, and then finally a mono echo. So let's make some fart noises and directly patch the first oscillator into the output of the device. And if we press seed, we could change the type of oscillator. And we have a lot of options. And then shape. So let's come out of the oscillator mixer, where we have all three plus a noise generator. actually completely forgot that we are only listening to the output of the oscillators and not the overall unit itself. So now that we have these oscillators synced in a subtle but interesting way, we also have this entire other filter built into the dynamics processor. And I'll show you how that works. with these really dynamic oscillators and filters alone, I have absolutely no doubts about how powerful this would be in a modular rack, but it does come at a price. I believe this costs $799, which makes it the most expensive new thing that's going into my modular system, but you do get what you pay for. To be completely honest, I don't really care about the clock or the sequencer or the arpeggiator, because I, I have way more interesting sequencers that this will be controlled by, and I kind of don't even care about the echo all that much. It's just really this, <laughs> and that 
to me is worth the money, especially considering that there's 60 different patch points. This is probably the best semi-modular standalone that I've ever played with in terms of capability and in terms of fun. So let's put it in the rack. Bastille Instruments Soft Pop 2 Semi-Modular Synthesizer retails for 559 US dollars. I would bet that for some viewers of this channel, this device needs no introduction. It is the Bastel Soft Pop SP2, which is pretty much insane. That's the best way I could describe it. Here's the thing though, it is not mountable in Eurorack unless you have a custom converter made to be able to do that. It can be powered by Eurorack power. All of this can be plugged in and out of normal Eurorack, but it cannot just be pulled out of its case and mounted, which it posed some challenges for me, but I got through it. The funny thing about the Soft Pop 2 is while it's natively almost like a pocket synthesizer that's powered by USB mini, doing a video covering all of the features would probably take 45 minutes. And so I'm not gonna do that here. I will have this on a stream and there are plenty of videos on YouTube that cover it extensively. And it also has a wonderful manual. You have an XY knob here that you could pretty much bind to anything. You have scales that you could snap to. Those are customizable, but they also have some in there. You have a whole bunch of patterns. You can chain those patterns and then it has a slide mode. All right, now these sliders. This is the pitch fader. This is a pitch modulator, which basically tells you how far the pitch can go from its original pitch. This is cutoff. This is basically how much the envelope affects the cutoff. This is the cycle rate of the envelope. And it gets very fast. And then you have a shape fader. We have a low pass filter. We have a band pass filter. And we have a high pass filter. And if we don't want an envelope connected to a VCA to be limiting these sounds, we could just turn this on drone mode. Okay, so patching. Let's patch the XY into PWM and then control that pulse width. Let's turn the pitch way down and then make that pulse width as thin as possible so it's just a gate. <laughs> and now let's put the pulse into the input of the function junction. And so now we have a gate generator that is as dynamic as every single pattern or pattern chain that I could put into the sequencer. Oh dear, I forgot to show you pop, which is in the name of the unit. Pop basically is a low bit, eight bit effect when you're playing a normal melody sequence on this. But when you're kind of diving deep like this, it makes really, really amazing effects. Surprisingly, the Soft Pop 2 emulates ATB303 rather well. If we patch triangle into the input, we will actually get a little bit more of that needed bass. So the first time I played with this thing was about a year ago, and I played with its predecessor before that. And I have never in my life sat down and been able to just make a normal melodic sequence with the sequencer. Like it's totally possible, but everything else is just so tempting to get weird that you just have to do it. And that's really why I like it so much is because it just encourages experimentation and that's what modular is all about, right? Bastille Instruments Aikido Dynamic Quad Voltage Controlled Amplifier and Mixer retails for 270 US dollars. One of the reasons I chose to lump all of these excellent modules into one video is because I feel like most people wouldn't watch a video about a VCA mixer because 
it's kind of a utility module, so you would never really be able to see why this one is unique. So these are mute switches. I'm gonna turn on channel A. I'm gonna plug the triangle oscillator output from the soft pop into the A input on the VCA mixer, and guess what? It behaves like a VCA mixer. Now, if we plug an LFO output into the CVA input, and turn the attenuverter up. It behaves like a VCA does. Okay, now let's plug pulse into the second one. And we could plug the bandpass filter into the third one. Let's take the square of this LFO and plug it into the input of function junctions A. Okay, now I'm going to plug the sum of all of the outputs into the CV of A's input. All right, now I'm gonna plug the output of C into the CV of A to create a kind of weird feedback. And I'm gonna take the first output into the sidechain input. <laughs> and so yeah, this is a little bit more than what you would expect out of a simple four channel mixer. I don't even know if you could really see it here, but there's this little switch and it changes the speed of the dynamic processing. It also has a traditional sidechain input where you could have a kick drum attenuate a bass signal or something like that, or however you want to use sidechaining. And then it even outputs the envelope of that sidechain so you could do something else with that and create a big pattern. It also has a spectral envelope, which is the overall, what, what you heard earlier when I killed that feedback, that would be the envelope of that being outputted outwards. And it is a really well-built, good sounding mixer, which is something I need in my rack. So that's why I have it. Erica Synth's Fusion VCO Tube Oscillator, version two, retails for 369 US dollars. I'm not sure that you could get any more analog than this. It has vacuum tubes. So far, it hasn't gotten too hot in this closed case, but I will be much more comfortable with it being powered on in a case that has a little bit more room to breathe than something this tight. I'm gonna patch this directly into the mixer here so you could hear the full buttery, warm analog essence of it over the terrible YouTube audio codec. So there's VCO direct out and mix out. As long as we have this set to dry, they will be the same thing. And let's just hear the wave shapes. All right, so once we get into wet mode, we have two different sub waves that we could bring in, a submix knob and a color knob, and we get all these sort of natural distortion sounds. If we patch a different oscillator into audio in, it will replace this oscillator. However, you'll still be able to bring in the subwaves, and the subwaves will stay in tune with the oscillator that you're patching in. I don't know how, but it does. So you can take an oscillator that's very digital sounding. I'm very excited to plug something like maths or function junction into this and see what kind of sound comes out and we will be doing that. Erica Synth's Graphic VCO retails for 395 US dollars. I've turned down the brightness so you could see the screen. Meet Graphic VCO. You are listening to the raw oscillator output. That being said, there are actually two oscillator outputs. To be completely honest, I have never been this excited about an oscillator before, and when initially ordering it, I expected it to be kind of a modernized form of a mutable braids type of digital oscillator module. It is so much more than that, and it is, it, well, just listen. And it's tuned completely down, we haven't even turned it up yet. Which 
let's go to the main menu page where we could select the different wavetables. We could also put it into A-B mode where we could select different slices and even edit them. If you don't feel like editing your own wavetables, you could choose presets. Or you could just keep hitting random until you find something you like. You could customize your sub-oscillator, and you could make that sub-oscillator a sine, a ramp, a triangle, a square, a pulse, or you could select it from <laughs> all of your wavetables. And then we have effects on the oscillator itself, so this is FM, we could assign that to a potentiometer, we could have that input, we also have an attenuator there, we can assign it to an oscillator. <laughs> so when sync is off, we have a normal FM oscillator, and this is a ramp oscillator, so I'm gonna turn the amount up to half, and then turn X up. And so now that sync is on, we get a little bit more of a linear FM vibe. So we have FM, we have ring modulation, we have phase distortion, which I absolutely love. And then we have wave folding. And then wave wrapping. And bit crushing. And finally, a nice digital distortion. Here in settings, you can calibrate it to a different tuning than A440. You can quantize the notes if you want. You can change the oscillator morphing from smooth to discrete. Beyond just wavetables, we have matrices of wavetables. Or so I assume. And then if we patch a gate into FM amount, and I, I'm not actually sure of this, I'm kind of freestyling. We can trigger drum sounds. Not sure if I would use it for that. Well, I guess. I'm sure I'm missing something or a lot of things, but I feel like this video is already going to be the length of a feature film. So let's move on to the filters. Erica synths black high pass and low pass voltage controlled filters with coupler. Please give me your full attention for just one moment and I will explain this as quickly and easily as possible. So the black low pass voltage controlled filter, excellent sounding, wonderful. The black high pass voltage control filter, excellent sounding. Now there is a black voltage controlled filter coupler that connects to these filters under the modules. And what it actually does is allows you to spread between the low pass and the high pass filter in one shot. And the bandwidth here allows us to pretty much create a notch filter or a scientific filter. Both the filters have their own drive. And so if I only wanted to mess with the low pass filter, I could just turn this high pass filter down. And by the way, what you're hearing right now is a sequence on the graphic VCO going into input one of the voltage controlled filter coupler. And input two is coming from fusion VCO, which is just on one note, which is why it kind of sounds paraphonic. By the way, I was just generating a simple envelope through this disting module here, but at the end of this signal chain, we have a four stereo channel mixer, which can sum a one input into left and right if you wanted to, or you can have left and right into left and right, however you wish. So typically in your subtractive synthesis setup, you have your left to right oscillators going into your filters, going into your amplifiers, and this, everything can kind of loop back and play with one another in really interesting ways. And I am so excited to get that into my rack. Erica Synth's Black Hole DSP2 Effect Processor. 
retails for 319 US dollars. I am both excited and very curious to hear the effects on this because I know that it uses a spin SV1 chip and I've made some reverb algorithms in SpinCAD myself. Sorry to get this dorky into things. There are a lot of great sounding effects pedals that use spin chips, but for me, with my clunky amateurish programming, I've always ran out of CPU power and had to go to something more powerful. So this Crush knob and Crush CV control is a great example of how Erica Synths adapted to those CPU limitations. It's essentially a quality knob, and when mixed with something like delay, you could get really long delays, but they're gonna sound like a Super Nintendo, or you could get really high quality, shorter delays. So if we go down in quality, the delay will get longer, but dirtier. <laughs> And a lot of people like this, myself included. With the crush all the way turned down and the quality turned all the way up, we have... Crystal clear sound. <laughs> Next up we have chirp delay. And I bet you could even tap tempo here. It says nothing about that in the manual, but something tells me you can. Yeah, I bet you can. A low pass delay. Beautiful. A high pass delay. A tap tap delay. So this is Hellraiser delay. And apparently when I turn this up after 12 o'clock, Hellraiser will come on. I feel like in a pedal that wouldn't be that cool, but in something that you could control with CV like this, pretty awesome. This is phased delay. And this will add phase here. have a pitch shift delay here, but we also have a shimmer drift. That's really nice. All right, so this is shimmer plus, which means it's going up an octave. This is pre-delay, this is reverb size, and this is the entire octave it's going up. Let's hear it. Eh, kind of an ugly shimmer. 12 should be the polar opposite. Finally, we get to reverbs. This is Big Hall. This is better than any reverb I've made on a spin chip. Room reverb. This is Stalker Reverb. Wow, I like this. Saturated Reverb. Ooh. All right, here is Havoc Chorus. This is the rate, this is the width. This is the feedback, which gets very crazy very fast. Here we have a servo flanger. Ooh. Usually not a fan of flangers, but I could see myself using this. Ripper. Ripper. 
All right, so this is like a low pass looper. Cool. And finally, our last effect is just a drone bank with three different frequencies. I see myself using those delays and reverbs more than anything else, and I'm excited to have these CVNs to control them. Good stuff. Erica Synth's four-channel black sequencer retails for 619 US dollars. Obviously, I am taking a huge liking to the black subcatalog of Erica Synth stuff, but this black sequencer takes the cake, and here's why. It costs about $600, and it doesn't have the biggest footprint, and all those things considered, it is a very powerful sequencer that can control up to four voices at once, control up to four modulators at once, has MIDI in and out, clock in and out, and a whole bunch of features that I'm gonna show you in a second. But the best part is that I never had to even look at a manual. I didn't even glance at one. You're able to just sit down and get going so quickly, and I realized that that was probably the biggest problem with my previous setup is that I could never just sit down for 15 minutes and make something and be inspired by it. It was always a huge ordeal. Obviously, once this is in the bigger modular system controlling a bunch of different ADSRs and filters and voices, it will be much more powerful. But listen to what I could do with the Taiga in about 10 minutes. All right, so twisting the main knob, we get to change the BPM. Here we have the notes that are being played that we can change through any of these knobs. If we hit shift, then we can add some glides. Second button is our gates. If we hold down shift, that is the probability that the note and gate will be triggered. Over here we have a ratchet, which you'll hear in a moment. We could also do repeats or re-triggers. We have the option to shuffle everything. If you want to create your own shuffle based on individual notes, you're welcome to do that as well. Now we are sending a modulator to the shape of the voice that we are controlling, and let's screw with that a little bit. On the other side of this button, we have an arpeggiator, which I'm not going to screw with right now. Here we have direction, forwards, backwards. Ping pong. Ping pong where it includes 1 and 16, or the first and the last, and then random. Then we can mute our channels or solo them. We could choose our projects or patterns. We could choose our banks or our songs. We can copy and paste and clear. Then over here we could set a clock divisor if we want to. And we could also set our master length. If you press magic in any of these things, it will randomize it. And I don't know if it's random or if it's deterministic in some way because it seems like I've had more happy accidents than I should have. Then you have set up here. So we have these bar pages. I believe you could go up to 64 per pattern and then play, stop, and record. All of this is actually happening on more than one channel because we could do it on four at once. And it's the exact same interface. All you have to do is hit this button and you can see what's going on there. Now channel three is only triggering three notes and it is doing it on a one thirty second divisor. I didn't just randomly pick a bunch of modules, by the way. In fact, I realized that a lot of the modules that immediately struck me as something I'd be interested in were too functional. For example, Ornament and Crime is one of my all-time favorites. It's easily the most powerful generative module available. But once you learn how to use it, you're going to keep creating these same types of songs over and over again, and it will eventually get boring. So I wanted to avoid digital modules or modules that had more than one layer of menu diving. I actually don't mind menu diving with something like a tracker because I can eat dinner while doing it, but having to squint and see a tiny screen and reach two to three feet away is a miserable way to make music. Also, I should tell you, at the risk of possibly frustrating some of the manufacturers, I hardly looked at any user manuals for any of this stuff. If I'm missing anything, that's because it wasn't obvious in the UI immediately. If I have to memorize something, then that means that I'm going to have to look at the manual again when I forget, and those are exactly the type of modules that I'm removing from my rack.
So you just heard my first patch on the newly renovated modular, and I don't think it was anywhere close to the best music I've ever made on a modular, but what I'm very happy about is that it sounds like nothing else I've ever made on modular previously, and I have no idea how I would go about making that on a DAW. I was sending a sequence of notes through an addressed switch to eight different envelopes, oscillators, and amps and then some filters as well. And they were all constantly swapping signal paths in the sequence. Then the poly end preset was randomly changing values in all of those things. All right, so what got voted off of the iWind, AKA my main rack? The Behringer Neutron, excellent value semi-modular synthesizer. If you have a rack like I do, it's very expensive in the amount of space it takes up. The Kilpatrick Audio Pattern Generator. I feel like I've only used it as a random clock source and there are plenty of smaller and better options for that. I so want to love the Spectral Multiband Resonator, but maybe it's just ahead of its time or maybe it's too limited. Oof. My Ardcore module is in the side rack, mostly because I would only use it for super specialized things. Same goes for the patch and it. I'm pulling that in and out of my rack too much anyway to make modifications for it. My old original build of ornament and crime had to go. It's time, I just played it out too much. Out went the Moog Mother 32. I plan on keeping it. It's a lovely semi-modular. I love the sound, but it's a bit limited and takes an enormous amount of space. The, the tiny expert sleepers disting is great for videos like this, but bad for real life music making. It is an insufferable amount of menu diving. The Expert Sleepers ES6 and ES8 never really worked well for me to bridge something like VCV rack and my actual modular. I just need to sell them. I had two different mutable instruments, clouds modules, one that had the original firmware, one that had third-party alternate firmware. I now own beads and can load the alternate firmware onto the original clouds. I took the Poly Hector out because I was just having a lot of problems with it, but you should know that that's because I got the very first pre-release batch from the company. And from what I hear, the production units don't have the same issues. I don't want to be negative about any modular company, but I've owned a Make Noise Morphe Gene and Mimeophon, both of which had this neat feature where it sounded an alarm when the one year warranty expired. And it was a very high pitched alarm known as a coil whine. <laughs> coil whine is an extremely high pitched tone that emanates from electronics themselves. Um, anybody watching this has surely heard it at some point in their life. You hear it in open air, not when you plug the module into something. There's nothing you can really do other than never plugging the module in again. And it's a bummer because these are not cheap modules. Modules. There are a few other things that I plan on replacing still, and I'll be at Perfect Circuit in a month, so I'm sure I will. You may have noticed that I'm using case power, and I'm also using a bunch of smaller external modular power supplies. This is because I'm testing the noise from each module and separating their power paths. Typically, digital modules or ones with big screens or animated screens or lots of LEDs are the loudest, and all of my analog function generators, oscillators, and filters are all sharing the same case power. I'm gonna vent here for a second. The power situation in general with Eurorack is a f***ing mess. It's not accessible and it's just way too easy to make a mistake that will either damage your modules or fry your entire system or burn your house down. Some modules take 16 pins, some take 10 pins, some take something entirely different, some don't even have a guide on which way you should be plugging them in, meaning that you'd be plugging the voltage into the wrong side. The ribbon cables, they're not that easy to maneuver, they take up way too much space. A lot of times they're cramped up behind modules where you have different parts touching one another through the ribbon cable, even though I know it's not really conducting, it does increase the chances of a short circuit. And they're not all that cheap and they don't isolate very well. And the pin difference means that you could have 10 different cables sitting there and none of them will be able to hook a module up to a power supply. And then sometimes the hot side of a cable is on the wrong side and it won't even fit into the back. It's just stupid. For the longest time, I've just fantasized about this imaginary modular format where you don't even have screws, the rails just lift up and you can move modules around. And the power cables could be ethernet, which I believe can carry up to like 48 volts safely and are super inexpensive and easy. Come to think of it, you'd even be able to piggyback power much more safely and you'd be able to send and receive data in between modules behind them. And you could keep the module size the same and make adapters that would allow you to power older modules as well. What I'm saying is that this took me over 12 hours to take all the modules out, unwire them, wire them back in properly, test everything, 
And a big part of what makes modular so awesome is being able to redesign your workflow and move things around. I think that if that were a lot easier, the whole format would be much more inviting to newcomers and musicians. Thank you for hearing me vent. And I feel like this video is probably going to be the length of a feature film. So if you've watched this far, thanks for coming with me on this journey. And if you liked what you saw, subscribe and all that stuff. If you really liked it and you want to join an incredible community of like-minded folks and participate in monthly songwriting challenges and download loads of music and audio assets and make videos like this possible, then my Patreon is right up your alley and you can join for as little as $1. All right, take it easy. Bye.